Hello everyone, I'm Keith Smith of the Fuel Podcast. Now, how much do you know about the influence of marketing business? Probably a bit more than me, but certainly a lot less than my guest on the show this week, Neil Schaefer. Neil's been at the sharp pointy end of the influencer marketing industry since the early 2000s, and his work is recognized globally by brands in such diverse industries as tech, finance, charities, and he knows the power of influencers that can be leveraged for any industry, B2B or B2C. Now, I first heard about Neil through my friend, May King Sang, hello May King, who told me to go read his book and then she'd introduce me. And Neil agreed to come on the show to impart some of his wisdom to our listeners in the new business and communications agency world. So here's me talking to Neil Schaefer for the Fuel Podcast. Enjoy. My guest this week is one of the go-to people when it comes to influencer marketing. Neil Schaefer has written best-selling books, appeared on TV shows, talked on radio shows, and boosted the ratings of many a lowly podcast, which I'm, I hope he'll do for this one as well, because he's a factual, actual expert on the world of influencer marketing, and we are very honored to have him with us. How much of an expert? Well, Neil is one of Forbes's top 50 social power influencers. He's an influencer evangelist who's on a mission to explain why and how his specialized subject is now one of the most important customer acquisition techniques of the 2020s. He's a believer, and I'm a believer, and we want you to be believers too. At heart, Neil is an educator, so it means that he doesn't come at a subject full of jargon and gobbledygook. He can explain things in simple terms so that even I, dear listeners, can become well-versed in this subtle art of influencer marketing. So please be upstanding for the man always known as Neil Schaefer. Thank you for coming on the show, Neil. Keith, that was brilliant. I'm, I'm literally speechless, but um, obviously honored by the invite. I'm really excited to get into our topic. Well, thank you very much, Neil. I, and I appreciate you carving some time out for us. I, I think it's going to become very clear pretty soon just how valuable all this content is. And I don't want to waste time digging up your education and your career history and all that sort of stuff. Long story short, in my opinion, you are super qualified as a, as a source. And if anyone has any doubts, can you just reel off a few of the companies that you've worked with? Um, Adobe, Microsoft, on the pond airways. Um, there's lots of companies. <laughs> Go to my website for the full list, but <laughs> exactly, exactly. But I mean, we're, we're talking, we're talking the, the premium, premium, premium end of, uh, of, of branding and, uh, and, and, and companies now, but, um, can you just explain what I saw this as, as your, your, um, on your qualifications, what does a fractional CMO do? Well, if you go to neilshafer.com slash what is a fractional CMO, you'll see the full answer. But um, joke aside, uh, I get asked that a lot. And a, a fractional CMO, so there are a lot of organizations that say not necessarily at the enterprise level, but at the small to medium-sized business level where they want marketing help. Now, what are the options they can, and especially at a senior level? In other words, someone that knows more about marketing than anyone else in the organization. So they can hire someone full-time, like a CMO, director of marketing, VP of marketing, which can be quite an investment for a smaller company. Right. Uh, they can leverage an agency and just completely outsource all of their marketing to an agency, which many companies do. Or they can hire a consultant, but a consultant is sort of tricky. It's sort of like a per project basis. And are they going to train people? Or that's, that's It's extra for training. And uh, it, it can get a little bit, um, you know, there's a sense that the IP is never fully transferred to the organization. So uh, fractional CMO really means it's like having your own CMO, but that's someone or, you know, marketing resource or VP marketing, whatever you want to call it. But that someone is also in the same role for other organizations. They are not a full-time employee and they're not a consultant because they're actually working at your company, either in person or, or, you know, virtually, they are helping training your employees. They're, they're part of the team, part of the internal reporting. Uh, and, and they're doing everything that an employee would do from strategy to training to implementation. So it, it's something that I found myself doing more and more of. And with everybody pivoting with the pandemic, um, I picked up a, a ton of new business around this concept of fractional CMO right when the pandemic started about a year ago. So I work with a handful of companies now in this role and each company has different needs. For some, they're launching a new brand, launching a new product. Maybe they just want to completely revamp their digital marketing. Uh, they want to start an online store. 
uh, they want to start a uh, employee as influencer, not employee advocacy, but employee influencer program. So there's lots of different reasons why businesses hire me. But instead of doing just a a one month consulting, I, I much prefer to do this because I feel like they have skin in the game. I have skin in the game. Um, I'm helping them as much as I can, and I'm learning from them as well. And I'm part of a team. So that, in a nutshell, is what a fractional CMO is. <laughs> so, I mean, in, in effect, you you are invested in their business as well. You're not just kind of parachuted in just to like fix things for a month and then uh, and then disappear off for you know. Yeah, and it it's like a PR agency. It's like a retainer contract. It's hours based, like uh, you know, a lawyer or what have you. And and therefore, while there is a contract term. As the fractional CMO, I want to make that as long as possible. So I want a renewal, even if it starts off short, I want to make sure that they renew. So it's like a professional athlete, you know, you're, you're always up for your next contract. Uh, and it's, it's a really good thing. It's, it's a great incentivizer, actually. Whereas the consultant is like, they got your money, they're gone in a month. I'm not saying that every consultant like that, but I'm sure, you know, there's some people nodding their head right now saying, oh yeah, we've gone through that before. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So when did you first become aware of the potential of social media? And uh, I mean, what, why were you attracted to it? The potential of social media. I feel like we need some dramatic, you know, orchestra music in the background. <laughs> um, you know, my background is in B2B, sales biz dev with with some marketing thrown in because i was you know country manager or, or regional manager in asia so it was really um you know I, i'll never forget back in 2004 i got this thing about linkedin and i joined it so i'm like one of the first million members right and back then there really weren't any other networks for professionals so when i moved back to the united states and this is in 2005 and then when I was in transition for the first time in 2008, I pretty much used LinkedIn as a tool to help me network and to you know help me find my next job. Right. Of course, we all remember that's originally what LinkedIn was for, but that sales and biz dev background taught me that this can really be used as a tool. I don't have to connect with people that I've only met. And at that time, Keith, you're not gonna believe this, but whenever you did a search for someone, let's say social media consultant, they didn't, we didn't have them, even have the term back then, but the person with the most connections would show up at the top of the search results. So there was an advantage to having more connections. And therefore I, I met a lot of people in a very short amount of time. And it's really when I found that job and it, it actually didn't happen because of LinkedIn, but um, I was already participating in local networking groups and, and sort of talking about LinkedIn and LinkedIn used to have a QA and a forum called LinkedIn Answers that I was participating in. I was, I was responding to questions in groups. And so when I got the offer for the job, at the same time, I launched my blog. And that blog is what's become neilshafer.com. This is back in July of 2008. I started blogging about LinkedIn. I ended up writing a book about LinkedIn in 2009. I got my first speaking gig in 2009. And in January, 2010, I had four local companies in various industries reach out to me, say, Neil, we want your help with social media. We don't know what we don't know. Please teach us. And that's where it all started. And because I don't have an agency background and my background's more B2B, I started the consultancy route. And I felt that what companies needed were they needed education, obviously, but they also needed a strategy. And that's really where I focused my efforts on social media marketing strategy and, and really training. Um, and that's, you know, uh, I had another job offer after that, that, that job that I got back in 2008 lasted three months. So that's why I was, I was back at it with, with the recession and, and Lehman brothers crash, what have you. But, um, but yeah, I, I realized in 2010 of January, the same month I got another job offer and the 20 something CEO said, Neil, if you're going to take this job, you need to pull the plug on social media. So it was almost like the powers that be, you know, were saying, Neil, here's the fork in the road. Do you want to go for social media where there's potential upsell? Or, or, you know, a potential upside, or do you want to go the proven corporate route? And that's where I decided, you know what, I'm going to, I'm going to go for the upside and, and I haven't turned back and I've been uh, lucky to have, you know, generous uh, and supportive clients and publish more books and, and speak and, and teach what have you. So it's been a great journey. I'm, I'm in my, uh, you know, 11th year now and uh, well, 12th year, I suppose, depending on the math and, and I love what I do. So well, it's a, it's it's amazing. You say you're in your eleventh or twelfth year. I mean, it's a very compact time frame. 
you know, that, that all this has happened for you, you know, and I mean, a lot of people, you know, sort of with, you know, in the agency world, you know, you're talking, you know, life, a lifespan of 20 or 30, you know, 25 years, something like that. So for this to have taken off in such a short amount of time, I think is, you know, is, is a testament to you in terms of how ahead of that curve you were. And I'm, I'm glad you kind of mentioned the book anyway, because um, that's obviously why I was attracted to you as a, as a, as a guest on the show anyway. Um, I mean, because right out of the gate, I mean, I've read, I'm re reading the book right now, but, you know, first couple of pages, your book is like smacking you in the face with facts and anecdotes. And I, I mean, I just thought it was, it's a fascinating book. And because our audience is, is comprised of creative comms agency, it's a great opportunity to, for you to kind of speak to them sort of directly. I mean, do you think that agencies should now have an understanding or a, at least a skill set about influencer marketing, regardless of whether B2B or B2C? Yeah, so you're referring to The Age of Influence, which I published in March of 2020. And it's, it's a book about influencer marketing. And as I reinterpret my own book, I think it's also about reimagining the role that brand should have in social media, right? So I, I do believe, you know, any stat you read, or at least the stats that I read, and I do bring up a lot of data and stats because I want to show you, uh, we, we are moved by data and by statistics and case studies, Not doesn't matter what I say. So I was pretty religious in that. But, you know, the stats have shown over the last five years that it would seem that more and more companies are taking their marketing in-house. And I don't know if, if the uh, people listening to this podcast would agree with me, but I see uh, you know, the, the Facebook ads, um, the Google ads, you know, them directly reaching out to businesses. You don't have to go through an agency. We can teach you how to do this. You got Facebook blueprint, what have you. It's still one of the most complex ad platforms to use, but nevertheless, um, and you know, you see more and more companies. I see an influencer marketing as well of taking, instead of, you know, throwing everything at an agency saying, you know what? we should be working with people that are already know, like, and trust our brand that are nano and micro influencers. We'll just work with them directly, right? So I think there's always gonna be a need for an agency. There's always a need when companies don't have the resources and or they don't have the know-how. So agencies aren't gonna go away, mm -hmm. but I do think that more and more brands feel empowered to do more in-house and there's less of a dependency on agencies than you would have seen maybe a decade ago with the emergence of social media where brands were just lost. So, um, so yeah, so influencer marketing is, is very, very interesting because it's this whole new economy that's come out of nowhere over the past five years. And now it's a multi-billion dollar industry. And I think that influencer marketing gets a bad rap because at the beginning, brands were just chasing vanity metrics. Agencies were more than happy to, to take the business and to, to be the matchmaker and everything was great. But you know, there's also been some some negative feedback that these people are in it just for the money. It's not authentic. And 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 therefore, you know, I, I want to just tell everybody that influencer marketing is more than just the Charlie D'Amalio's on TikTok or the Kardashians. Um, it's really the concept that in organic social media, businesses lose and people win. OK, yes. so, and, and that that, you know, I've always said one of the first things, first presentations I gave, social media was made for people, not for businesses. Businesses are already at a dis are, are always at a disadvantage. And when you go to social media marketing conferences and they have tracks on Facebook ads, that's paid media. That that is not, you know, organic is earned, right? But businesses aren't earning anything on social media if they're not inciting word of mouth. And that, you know, throwing up three pieces of content every week on your Hootsuite it, with the algorithms the way they are is probably not inciting much organic word of mouth. What incites organic word of mouth are people that rule the algorithm, people that get great engagement on their content, right? Those are people that over time have yielded influence. And these people are content creators in a lot of different niches. Some, yeah, have a few million followers. Some have a few hundred thousand followers. Some with a few thousand followers are probably outperforming your business page that has 50,000 followers. It's all because... I, and, you know, we go to the Edelman Trust Barometer, we go to, you know, Nielsen Report back in, two, back in you know, 2009 or 2008, we trust 92% of people trust recommendations from people like them. And it's this whole thing that social media has democratized influence, right? To the point where, you know, I work with the biggest business book publisher in the United States, 
And uh, the agency owners out there will, will get a laugh at this. I said, well, you know, should I be doing traditional media outreach? What, what, should I hire a publicist? What should I do, you know, to, to promote my book? And their response was, the most effective way to promote your book is to reach out to podcasters and bloggers. <laughs> and I think that, that, that says it all. That's new media. That's where the influence is, right? And I think that businesses are waking up to this fact. More businesses are starting their own own media on this outlet. And they are doing more with influencers, but not just expensive people that have a lot of followers, but they're building communities of brand ambassadors that are nano influencers. They're starting to leverage their employees as influencers. We, just, we see a lot of this in B2B. And, uh, you know, to me, it's really exciting. And I think that, you know, if the role of the agency is to lead, is to tell brands you're doing it wrong, right? Then influencer marketing really is, is a great opportunity to tell them you're doing this wrong, especially if you're not getting any organic social media uh, business from them anyway, sure. to be able to pitch them on something. And I have already had, <laughs> I've already had agencies come out to me saying, Neil, we want you to teach our agency, how do we make money with influencer marketing? So we've seen some influencer marketing specific agencies pop up, but at the end of the day, I see brands going back to the, the agencies they have a relationship with, right? So if that is you, you don't want any other agency to come into your client and say, hey, we can do influencer marketing and your current agency can't. I do believe that, you know, it's going to come to the point where uh, to a lot of companies, influencer marketing might be a shiny new object or they might want to get ROI from it they don't have right now. So I do believe that it's something that every agency should be aware of. Every agency should ideally be experienced with and every agency should have this default service package that speaks to the needs that brands don't even know they might have with influencer marketing. Because in my mind, a brand's organic social media should be 100% user-generated content driven by influencers. And if you can help your clients get there, it's gonna be beneficial for, for everybody. It's gonna be beneficial for the brand, for your agency, for the influencers, and for the fans and consumers. Fantastic. I'll stop there. I know that was a lot to digest. <laughs> well, you actually answered about three questions in one go there. So that was, that was really <laughs> nicely done. But uh, uh, actually, uh, Neil, I, I, I do have a tip for you. All right. When you're when you come out with your next book, um, could you could you please put a margin on it so that people can leave notes and stuff? Because I, I, my, I, my copy of your book is just absolutely I've scribbled all over it now. So uh, I, I think it'd be good if you could just leave a little margin down there so people can make notes. It's, uh, that would be and really helpful. Thank you. I am working on my next book. So thank you for the <laughs> a slightly bigger format. But uh, I mean, I, the the one of the, the things that you touched on there uh, earlier was the the idea of credibility and we, we will come on to this a, a little bit more but i mean because you know back in the day you know they used to have like four main sort of marketing channels four ways to reach the public you know you got tv movies you know radio and print and now we've got as you've you've quite rightly said you've got nano influencers you've got podcasts you've got vloggers you've got live streams clubhouse etc i mean do you think that the the influencer marketing market should be just as much of a a focus now for budgets i mean you know you said it's a multi billion dollar industry i mean it's it, it is one of it is now a legitimate spend surely for 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 clients and brands isn't it yeah i mean it really should be a line item um, I mean, think about it, right? I, it, in my book, I go through, well, you know, when we think of digital marketing, where are the different places we can invest? So it begins with your website and user interface and, and personalization. There's obviously a lot that we can do there. Uh, we then get to, well, we need our website to be discovered in search engines. You get to the search engine optimization, the organic, you get the paper click on the paid. You move a little bit further down. It's like, well, we need to have content on our site for the SEO, which is the blogging, but also we need content for everything we do in social media as well, right? Uh, we need email marketing and marketing automation in order to better own that, that customer um, who comes to our website or, you know, whether from Google or from social media. Um, we need to have obviously organic social media. It becomes part of this as well. So you have all these different pieces and then I believe you have the influencer marketing it becomes another piece. And, and my definition of influencer marketing are other influential social media users. So not just, as I said, those celebrities, but social media users that are your employees, social media users that are your customers, social media users that are your fans that engage with you, as well as other people that are not part of your brand affinity that we would call influencers, but they don't necessarily have to be celebrity influencers. So I believe, you know, once again, social media 
the promise of social media was viral word of mouth, right? And it was successful to a certain extent when Facebook in its heyday, 2012, 2013, where some brands were forwarding their domain name to their Facebook page because it was that viral, right? Of content getting it in the news feeds of friends of friends. That was the promise. The reality is it's pay to play, right? But you cannot ignore social. It is still the number one thing we do online. You need to be seen there. And an ad is an ad. There's nothing organic. There's, ads do not spark word of mouth. You need to leverage other people's voices. And that is where influencer marketing comes in. So yes, it should be a spend. Uh, it should be a line. I'm not saying you want to devote 100% of your marketing budget to it, but I'll tell you, when I talk to young startups, right? I mean, they, they immediately go to influencer marketing as their first marketing channel because they know that that's going to be the quickest way to get the word out about what they're doing. So there are some case studies in my book, but there are tons of brands, especially Instagram-centric B2C brands that, you know, it, it's all about influencers. I mean, it's like 80% of their budget all goes in there and that's how they've been successful. That's incredible. That's a, that's a phenomenal um, fact as well. And I, I mean, yeah, you're right that it shouldn't, it, you know, it, it doesn't need to be, it doesn't need to, to, to cannibalize other budgets, but it should, it definitely uh, has earned a seat at the table now. And I'm, I'm so glad that you, you brought up because it's, it's a fascinating subject, the idea of employee influencers as well, and there being a, an internal influencer program as well. I mean, um, one of our previous guests who we have in common, we know mutually anyway, May King Sang, she, she actually sort of introduced me to this whole idea of when we discussed sort of employees as influencers. And I recently did a podcast with um, a gentleman called Julian Balding, who runs one of the, uh, the world's largest kind of independent uh, advertising agency networks and he was actually in a pitch recently where it were for a beauty product which was one on the strength of the fact that the the pitch itself was pretty kind of you know meh but the, they won the account on the fact that that one of the account team was actually a, a, an influencer in a spare time and the brand instantly gravitated towards that so that being said what what kind of advice can you give companies that will help them along the road to developing an influencer program? How, how do you get people on side to do that? Yeah, that's a great question. And I love that example. And, you know, more brands are hiring influencers, right? And when I talked about brands leveraging user-generated content, that means that they're giving less money to agencies for content creation and they're directly engaging with influencers to get that content. So the first step, might be just to hire an influencer to be part of your team. You know, I think a decade ago, I've actually worked with agencies before, right? And a decade ago, social was sexy because brands were still trying to figure it out. And if you could pitch and show some results and brands were all over it and social is not sexy anymore, right? But influencer marketing is sexy. And I think by saying, you know, the thing, the, the struggle that brands have, believe it or not, with influencer marketing is they don't know how to engage with them, Right. And, you know, I, I believe that influencer marketing is, is more of a PR job than a marketing job. It is a one-to-one, -one, not one-to-many. It is developing relationships, right? So having someone on your team that speaks to speak, that talks to talk, because influencers also have their own networks of other influencers, right? They understand how to create content from a user perspective, not a brand perspective. So, um, you know, I'm not just going to say, Hey, hire any old influencer, but that is definitely, you know, a, a quick start. You know, also there are more marketers that do have experience in influencer marketing, people that work at influencer marketing agencies, for instance, uh, people that have worked on campaigns and, and, uh, you know, interestingly enough, a lot, of, a lot of these people are young people, people in their like young twenties, um, that are really tapped into TikTok and Snapchat, what have you. It is a resource to have one of these people on your team uh, and they can provide a lot of input at those meetings where the older executives may not be able to have any input actually. Right. So, uh, so I, I definitely, you know, think that's one way to go. I think the other way to go is really that brands understanding their clients should already start to engage with influencers and try to build relationships with them saying, Hey, we have a client. They don't see the need for influencers yet. We believe if you collaborated with them, then there's a lot of great things that can happen. We want your help in pitching our client. We want to develop a relationship with you. What do you think our client should be doing? You can hire an influencer as a consultant and you could actually be creating 
pitch decks <laughs> together with the influencer because they know how it works. They understand pricing models, what have you. And you could, you know, create a team of, of a few influencers for each of your clients and pay very little money, get a lot of knowledge, but be able to actually pitch the brand with some very, very specific examples. Wow. So that's another piece of advice. I mean, the, the sky's the limit. There's so many different things you can do, but it all comes down into tapping into influencers or finding someone who has experience tapping into influencers. And so, I mean, getting on to what, what you said right at the very start about fractional CMOs, I mean, you know, could you, could you envisage there being sort of fractional influencer marketing people as well? within it. Yeah. I mean, that's, yeah, that's, I mean, one of the roles I do play is, is, right. you know, it's specific. We don't want to have a full-time influencer marketing person, but we want to have someone on our team that can go into pitches with us, that can work with us on proposals that can train and educate us. Absolutely. Right. Right. Well, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Thank you. Now um, you, you did actually, um, I mean, we were talking about, you know, you, you alluded to the idea that um, the, uh, the influencer market, you know, has, uh, has a, a credibility or, or did have a credibility issue. And now we had a, uh, a podcast recently with um, a gentleman called Yuan Soke, who was the, uh, the ex-CMO of Anheuser-Busch. And, and uh, he's now uh, at, the, at a company or their, their joint venture company called Tilray, um, called Fluent Be Beverages, which is part of uh, a, a joint venture with Tilray. And he basically said that um, the influencer market was fickle. And he sort of said, basically, you've got to be careful because a lot of celebrity influencers can be, you, you could be outbid. So they might be promoting your product today. And then tomorrow your competitor comes along, pays a bit more money and they start promoting the, the, the other guy's product. And I think probably what he's trying to get at is the transactional relationship and the fact that it's kind of, it's not one of those things that you can throw money at specifically and let that be the 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 uh the the sort of the, the the main reason for the relationship now in terms of allaying fears i mean are there ways to address that 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 as a as a perception that that are held by come at some of these um kind of category a marketers well nobody can see this but i've i have a big smile on my face and and no offense to the to you know your podcast guest but that is an example of how brands have totally done influence marketing all wrong. It, it, they are a victim of chasing the vanity metric of spending a lot of money on people that seem to be influential. Did they ever ask the influencer, have you ever drunk a bottle or a can of our beer before? They probably didn't, did they, right? They probably just went after the followers. And that is the whole issue with the industry. That's why, the, that's why we need to completely disrupt the industry. And the best way to disrupt it is actually only engage with influencers that are your fans that have actually used your product before. How else can they authentically talk about your product? So yes, he is absolutely right. It's fit what's transactional because brands made it that way. Right. Right. I mean, if, if you're just going to throw money at someone and that's why you need to develop relationships, it needs to be long term. It's not a one night stand. It should be a marriage. And my God, there are, you know, I'm a big fan of Zima. Well, I think Zima might be a Coors drink. It's one of those unique sort of light, uh, clear beer beverages. But oh my God, there, there are huge fans of uh, any brand out there. You have your fans, right? <laughs> and with, with the definition of influencers, you know, at the nano level, 1000 followers, you just got to find them. And you got to engage with them. You got to activate them. That to me is influencer marketing. It's not this BS, you know, treating people as programmable ad units where yes, they do outbid each other. And unfortunately, I think that agencies have played a role in this, right? Agencies need to educate brands as well. If not, at the end of the day, you know, maybe he didn't say so on this podcast, but maybe, you know, right after the podcast, he goes, man, I got screwed by that agency who tried to sell me on this. So I think agencies need to be careful as well, uh, because if, if you've been doing that sort of business, that's going away as, as the market matures, but you need to be the leader and really educate your customer and show them this is the way we're going to do it. It takes a little bit more time. This is what we're here for, but we're going to do it right. And you know, guess what? When you do that, you get greater content. You can leverage that content for your organic social, your paid social, your, your, you know, your website. It's going to build trust because they talk about your brand better than you can. You had you now have a new user focus group that's really tied into social, really understands what people are talking about on social when it comes to your product or your competitors. There are so many advantages of this. 
uh, and, and, you know, because they chase the vanity metric and just look at follower count, um, you know, they've done it to themselves. So uh, I'm very sorry, but I, I've just seen so many brands waste so much money on it. And it, it's sort of, it's almost a joke at this point um, when, when I still hear that today in 2021. And no, like I said, no offense. I have, I have full respect for Anheuser Boys. Don't get me wrong. And, and they're not alone a lot. And, and this is why I think that um, that is the sign that, that's what a lot of people think of when they think of influencer marketing. I've been on a number of podcasts like this, Keith, where they said, you know, I, I cringe at the word influencer. Uh, and there's a lot of people and, and executives out there that do that. And, and it's because they, they need to, they need to be reeducated. They just, they, they've misunderstood. Mass media has not been too kind about influencers, either, you know, the fire festival, what have you. So um, yeah, um, I'll never forget when I was a junior in university and I did a year abroad in China and I was in Thailand during my Chinese New Year break. I met a gentleman and he was a businessman and we had lunch together and we walked by, by a Buddhist monk who was begging for money. And he goes, you know, Neil, let me teach you something. Only the fools let themselves get fooled. And it's, it's, <laughs> it's something that stuck with me to this day. It's why I, I include so much data and case studies in my book because it is unmistakable the ROI that you can generate when you do it right. The problem is few brands are doing it right. I, th I think it was you actually, Neil, that, that when we spoke, first time we spoke, you actually used the, the term, which I, I think it, the phrase, which I love, which is don't bring opinions to a data fight which I think is, uh, you know, I, I thought that was a fantastic line. So uh, no, you're ab absolutely right. But I mean, on the other side of things, I mean, in the UK recently, um, the, a brand or a company that you're, you're aware of, and obviously it's a company called Avon. And now they um, reported that, you know, sort of during the COVID-19 pandemic, that they had a 30% a increase in uh, Avon reps joining its business. Now, I mean, Avon has suddenly decided to invest heavily into its di sort of digital business, shifted a lot more into social media, and it's kind of creating its own smaller influencers. And uh, the lingerie company and Summers in the UK is doing a similar thing. And one would assume that there's kind of anyone doing direct selling would be looking to, to leverage social media to, to kind of augment it, its marketing. I mean, is there a difference between the, the um, sort of straight up uh, influencer marketer and social selling. I mean, are they they two distinctly different uh, practices? Well, I have a B two B sales background, so my definition of social selling is sales. It's where social media can help you in the sales process, and it's normally related to uh, selling into organizations, right? <clears throat> where you have to sell into a team of buyers, and you need to get various approvals. Right. So, you know, if you just need the approval of one person. Um, you know, to me, that's more of, 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 of the marketing. I mean, obviously there's sales involved as well, but to me, it, it, it's mainly marketing, but you know, it is interesting. You know, one of my clients is in the real estate industry and yeah. Um, you know, I, I've seen companies where they say every one of our salespeople are influencers and it makes a lot of sense because at the end of the day, people buy from brands, but also people they like know and trust and social media when done right, gives people a great way to do that. So Avon and many other companies as well, they've suddenly accelerated 10 years of digital marketing into, you know, one year post COVID. Um, but yeah, there are tremendous opportunities because it taken advantage of the fact that we trust people. Now the challenge from the Avon salesperson side is they have to be really careful because if you think that social selling, the way that we're talking about direct, you know, direct to consumer here is all about just promoting what you're doing, people tune you out really quick and you lose friends. But I will say there's a new generation of, of you know, uh, millennials that are really good at subtly dropping hints that this is what they do for a living while, while genuinely adding value and, and creating relationships. So there is a good way to do it. And those people I think are going to do really well. And I think at the end of the day, they're going to become like influencer free agents that other competing brands would love to hire. Sure. Just like salespeople of the old, because they can bring you know, we talk about the Rolodex back in the day, uh, <laughs> they can bring over their community, right? Yeah. And, you know, I think 10 years ago, we saw this, we had people being hired away because of their personal brand. And so it wouldn't surprise me now that influence is so democratized that we begin to see individual, you know, influencers be the same. Wow. That's fantastic. Now, I mean, I, I did, before we, we went ahead with this interview, I, I asked my, my social media, so my own my own sort of social media circle to, to chip in with some questions. Uh, I don't know whether you noticed or picked up on it, but straight out of the gate, we had uh, a lady called Zeta McMillan and she's in, uh, she runs a, a FinTech business called Predictive Black. 
And um, they're a financial analytics company, but they're, they're firmly in the B2B space. And um, just to, to kind of put this into context, um, as a news uh, report, the Advertising Standards Authority for Ireland said that uh, there was a story out that said 51% um, 50, of Irish people say that they are concerned by a lack of transparency in influencer marketing. And that research found that there were some nearly 60% consider influencers not to be authentic and to be annoying or 57% get annoyed at seeing too much sponsored content in their post. And Zeta's question actually got right to the heart of it because with all the, the negativity, and I think you have sort of alluded to this earlier, but with all the negativity having a, a, an effect on influencer marketing in general, how... I mean, how can you address that kind of that that kind of negativity? What what's your kind of blowback on that? Well, once again, are people working with the right influencers? When they're vetting an influencer, are they working with people with every post as a sponsored post? To me, that is not a good influencer to work with. Right. And really good influencers are making sure they have a balance, right? They know that if every post is an ad, they're going to lose influence. They're going to lose followers. So the really smart ones are very savvy at this. And they're, they're trying to keep it at a certain ratio where their fans don't think that every post is an advertisement. Um, but, you know, I would, all, I would also, you know, argue that once again, um, brands have worked with the wrong influencers. They've imposed their brand guidelines to the point where cut and paste this text or, you know, I, I get pitches, right, from different brands like go to a Walmart, make sure you're standing in, you know, in, in like the house goods aisle with a box of like Cheerios. I mean, th these are not the real brand names and talk about how you love to, you know, shop at Walmarts on, on Saturdays during the springs. I forgot what it was, but it was so restrictive, right. Of treating people like programmable ad units. Right. And that content is cringeworthy content. I don't think influencers enjoy publishing that content, but it's money. And a lot of them will take the money. Right. So that, that is the problem, right? Once again, the brands have created the issue and no wonder why people don't trust the content because it doesn't look like natural content. Really good influencers post really good content where they go, yeah, you know, this ad was sponsored, but I've been a fan of this, you know, man, I, I grew up eating this stuff or whatever it is. They're able to pitch it in a way where it does not seem like an advertisement. So the fact that people think that it, it's too spammy, uh, to me, you know, I'd, I'd say that's, that's the brand's uh, engaging in, in um, worse practices with not the most ideal influencers. And I would then argue, well, okay, so let's forget about influencer marketing. How do you like your posts getting 0.01% engagement on Facebook? How do you like your posts getting 0.03% on Instagram, right? Uh, and how do you like the spend you have with paid media? Do people trust that? We, have, we don't have influencer blockers yet, but we do have ad blockers. So once again, right, if you want to make word of mouth happen in social media in an authentic and organic way there's there you still have the challenge so and this is where if you work with people that are authentically interested they have an authentic relationship with your brand to me that is that, that is the answer and that that's really what i'm a proponent of i'm not i'm not saying you throw money at people with a lot of followers by any means although you know you might find among your customer database should you do some social appending to it you might find, as one of my uh, beauty clients found, that indeed they had verified Instagram users with you know hundreds of thousands of followers that were users of their product, right? And they had uh, never talked about them, but their golden opportunity for them to reach out to them and start a relationship. That same company, I don't know if you remember the Huda Beauty, she's one of the biggest influencers on Instagram, like 30 million followers. She organically mentioned my client's brand and recommended it, right? Nobody paid her to do that. Now, I can vouch for that. So really good influencers it's not all sponsored content they're they're providing value they're providing advice they want to be seen as the go-to person and those are the people you want to work with so should the industry be um sort of uh, audited i mean should there be should there be a uh, you know a sort of a a code of conduct for the industry well well we have the federal trade commission does have influencer guidelines so the guidelines are there and brands have to follow it. Influencers follow, need to follow it. And brands need to make sure it's in a contract with influencers that they will follow it. And so I think that brands need to impose this on influencers in a very, very serious way. So that's the first step. Um, but outside of that, you know, I, I don't know what else as an industry, other than making sure that we're aware of that, 
and the influence is very clear. Uh, I don't know what else we can do. I mean, how far do, you know, if I'm an employee at a company and I talk about that company on my feed, do I have to put hashtag ad? Right. If I'm a, you, if I'm a, if I buy, if I buy, you know, this brand's products, I mean, I'm drinking Perrier water and then I post something on Perrier, uh, you know, do I have to post that? I, I suppose if I got this one bottle for free, I should say I got it for free, but um, it raises some interesting questions about how far, you know, I understand with TV ads, with, with medical, you know, with pharmaceuticals, you need all this lingo, right? But, you know, when Shaquille O'Neal, the famous basketball player is advertising for Buick, is it saying that he got paid to do that ad? We, we, you know, we, we can imagine that he got paid without it having to say Shaquille O'Neal got paid. This right. is not Shaquille O'Neal's personal opinion. Shaquille O'Neal does not necessarily drive a Buick. So, you know, it's, it's really interesting how, and I think it's the same with social media, you know, 10 years ago, what's the ROI of social? What's the ROI of everything else? What's the ROI of your print media? So many CEOs couldn't answer that, but yet they had a double standard for social. I sort of think there's some of this is, is a double standard for influencer marketing. Somehow they're duping people, they're cheating people, and we need to have extra stringent things that we don't have on other media. So, so that, that, that's my two cents. Okay. Well, no, I mean, you know, I think it's an important thing moving forward because obviously it, it speaks to a lot of different parts of the, the, the influencer marketing um, sort of spectrum in terms of its authenticity and, you know, how much people sort of tolerate a brand and sort of whether they think the person's just saying it because they're getting paid. So I think it's, you know, it's, a, it's an important part of it. But I mean, again, what you're, you're, what you're typically saying is that if the agency observes the correct code of influencer marketing, then these sorts of things shouldn't really come up because, you know, they're just part and parcel of somebody's lifestyle, really, these elements. Yeah, you know, a native ad on, on Instagram will, you know, it, it'll, or, you know, on a social network, it, it'll say, you know, uh, promoted content, right? And now Instagram and Facebook, they do have, it'll say, you know, branded co content in partnership with. And if every social network would do this, that'd be great. They don't all do it. So the social networks themselves are part of the problem. But right. clearly with Facebook and Instagram, you want to make sure that you do that. And, that, and that's all really you should need to do. I mean, it's just like an ad sponsor content, you know, a brand partnership content, you shouldn't need to go overboard with this. Uh, it, it, otherwise it's a double standard. So, so yeah, I, I think it is the responsibility of the brands to be sure of this and, uh, and do a bye-bye because every once in a while the FTC will come out with some random ruling um, and they'll, you know, they'll take someone to court. You know, it seems like every one or two years, there's some brand that gets slapped and some agencies have gotten slapped as well. So I, I, I would be, I, I would stick true to that. And really it's a, it's a best, uh, uh, it's a win-win for everybody, right? Um, it, it's just very clear as to what's going on, but the influencers, the good ones, even though it says paid partnership, they will be able to talk about it in a very, very authentic way that can still move the needle for the brand. That's that's a very important thing to to um, to talk about in terms of moving the needle, and uh, I'm glad you provided me with a, a perfect segue. Thank you, Neil, because um, the one of the things that that's come up over the last year or two, uh, uh, over the last year of pod, of the of our podcast, has been the idea that or the the theory that CMOS uh, often have trouble moving into the CEO uh, position because they're speaking a different language. Um, and they're not actually speaking the the sort of shareholders language. They're they're using metrics that aren't sort of profit and loss things. And when you talk about things like engagement and moving the needle, I mean, what is the definition of that in a boardroom context? Uh, well, it, it's the bottom line, right? It's that th these marketing efforts generated. Uh, you know, we look at it in terms of the funnel. And at the end of the funnel, our sales, our leads that we can attribute if, if there's dedicated salespeople closing them. Um, I believe that, you know, marketing is, is the key to any successful organization today, especially as we move to a, a digital first society. So I think it's up to the CMOs to be able to talk about the value, um, not just, you know, look at the big picture because marketing does impact the bottom line. And it's time for CMOs to step up and, and let people know that, let people know that they've been successful because of all these digital initiatives and don't focus on the vanity metrics, focus on the funnel, right? And focus on, you know, when I work with clients, we have various KPIs and one of them obviously are comparative metrics. So, you know, this is how we're doing. 
some of those vanity metrics I wouldn't use, but in terms of comparisons with our competitors and social share of voice, what have you, it is part of the picture. We know that we're being heard more than our competitors. We know that we're growing at a faster pace. We don't know how many leads and how much sales they get, but based on these numbers, we, we're pretty confident we're doing pretty good, right? Um, those are the things that you need to talk about. You don't talk about ad spend. You talk about for every dollar we're investing in our Amazon ads, we're making $2.50. We're making $4. We're making $10, right? That, that, those are the types of conversations. You know, CEOs speak the language of Excel and, um, and, and you know, profit and loss and everything, profit and expense, everything goes into that. So uh, those are the things that um, the, the savvy CMO you know, I, I think they should be able to talk about. I think it's just a matter of looking at that bigger picture and understanding even further the impact that they have, especially when we talk about product marketing alone of, of launching, you know, strategic products and the impact that they've had in the bottom line and what have you. And the great thing is with digital, it's, it's measurable, right? And we can go into our CRMs and we can look at, you know, loyalty and net promoter score. And this, there's just so many angles in which we could talk about the value that we're bringing to the business that it, it's a shame that more CMOs really don't step up uh, and, and start to paint that picture, leveraging all the internal data that they have. I got to say, Neil, I mean, I, I, the, the way that you speak reminds me of sort of back in the early 90s when I started getting into uh, into web development and stuff like that. There's there was a, a, a lag between the science and, you know, sort of what 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 we could all see as as being the future and how that was being sort of interpreted behind. There's kind of an L elasticity between the, the the two things and I am absolutely 100% convinced that you're right on this and I know that everybody is going to sort of catch up at some point soon and I'm, I hope it's going to be sooner rather than later um, sort of as far as this is concerned. And, and Keith that's why I'm proud to say my background is in sales it's my I don't have a traditional PR background or marketing background everything had to lead to sales right uh, I lived quarter to quarter and it's that mentality. It's also that way of dumbing down things so that, you know, if this is not going to impact sales, why are we doing it? Right. You know, and it's funny. I was on a, I was on a panel yesterday. <laughs> it's like, Hey, you, you know, if you stay off clubhouse for a month, it's not going to impact your sales probably. Right. If you don't do a reel on Instagram, you're not going to lose any business from it. So you, you got to take on the other hand, you know, moving up from a number three to a number one rank, for a very important keyword, now that could actually impact your business, impact your bottom line. So it's really everything we do in marketing, putting it all in that perspective of the bottom line, it's always the way I've thought. And I think if more marketers think that way, I think that they're going to be allocating their resources in the best places. Oh man, that's a great way to, that's a great way to round that conversation off, Neil. Thank you very much. And uh, now I know you're a busy guy and, uh, but I'd like to, to, I'd like to hang on to you for at least another couple of minutes. Um, I mean, firstly, uh, in terms of what's coming up, you said, you, are you writing a new book? I am. And you know, it's funny. Um, the age of influence published March of 2020. I work with, you know, Harper Collins, a very large publisher. So uh, an overwhelming majority of it was, was written in 2019. I got it. And really, just, oh, there we go. Look, I do have it. And look, thank you, my friend. Here's all my, look, let me show you all my notes that I've got written in. <laughs> look, look, I've got pages of little notes in the margin and stuff. Brilliant. So anyway, it's a great book. I do recommend people buy this one, but the next one is well, about what? So it's funny because I, this fractional CMO experience, uh, and especially with the coronavirus pandemic and, and picking up clients after that, a lot of clients have, have reached out to me because of the book and because of influencer marketing. But it's like, okay, before we get to influencer marketing, I told you all those different things you can do from a digital marketing perspective. You know, oh, well, we don't have an email marketing list or we don't have any blog content or, you know what I mean? So it's like, well, wait, 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 let's, before we get to influencers, we need to come back to our own digital infrastructure. Right. And this has led me to my own sort of method methodology of working with clients with what I just call a digital first mindset. And that's digital first will probably be part of the naming of the book, but it's just a brand new mindset for the 2020s of, you know, it, at the end of the day, if we want to digitally, 100% digitally engage with people, right? We have web, we have email, we have social. And once we dumb it down there, 
we begin to see the different things that we need to do. Some of it is just going back to the basics in all honesty, but it's looking at things like, okay, I'm a B2B brand, um, you know, the FinTech company, what am I going to do with influencer marketing? You know, talking, no, you're not going to necessarily hang out with people on Instagram or TikTok, but you are going to be hanging out with FinTech bloggers, right? And if you're really smart about it, you're not just hanging out to invite them to your webinars, what have you, but you might also be able to generate backlinks. And you may find that some of them have a higher domain authority than you have, right? So you begin to look at developing relationships as being central to success sometimes with web. With email, it's all about relationships and personalization and marketing automation. And with social, it's all about relationships with influencers. So this notion of you know, digital first, yet relationship first, might seem to be on opposite ends of the spectrum, but actually they go hand in hand. So um, I have a lot of, you know, new case studies and, and just experiences of working with various clients. And I'm, you know, the, the one client I work with where when I came in, they were doing uh, a lot of Google pay-per-click. Um, they were spending five figures a month, getting no conversions. We, we pulled the plug on that. We blogged on, on a, a very good keyword strategy. And, you know, six months later, we now have more organic traffic than was generated from those ads. And we have more conversions than were generated from those ads. So uh, I know that this stuff works when done right, when done strategically and intelligently. And uh, that's the sort of advice that I want to bring, not just on influencer marketing, it'll be part of it, but more of a general, I really want to make this the digital marketing playbook for the 2020s. Awesome. So uh, I, I'm trying to hide my excitement. Um, I'm still in the, uh, the idea, uh, idealization phase. Um, but I'm very close to starting the book proposal and, and starting to put pen to paper. Well, I guarantee you, I'm going to be in line when it first comes out. It's, uh, that's, that's going to be, it's, uh, I, I truly do believe um, in, uh, in, in, in your, uh, your theories here. So, uh, so that's great. Well, thank you. But when, when you aren't sort of putting ideas down for the book and stuff like that, I mean, uh, just um, how do you relax? How does a man like you relax? How do I relax? Well, uh, first of all, when I'm working, I am uh, organizing my CD collection. So music uh, relaxes me. Tapping back into my past and connecting the dots allows me to be extremely creative. Um, and, you know, when I'm creative, I feel relaxed. So in a weird way. So yeah, um, that's part of what I do. Uh, every night before I go to bed, I have my binge watch. I'm currently watching Vikings. What a fantastic oh, yes. series. I'm still only in season three, so no spoilers there. So I have, you know, I'm, I'm an avid sports fan. So I'm in Los Angeles. So we got the Lakers, we got the Dodgers, uh, big uh, uh, football fan as well. So uh, we, we're, we're Chelsea fans here at home and uh, big Messi fans as well. Um, so yeah, uh, I try to do it. Believe it or not, I try to go walking for 45 minutes to an hour uh, every day. I usually, I like to do that when I'm not too busy in the mornings before I start my day of work. And I have a high schooler and a junior high schooler. So like today, I'm going to go see my daughter uh, play soccer on, you know, play football on, on her, uh, uh, for her team in high school. And, uh, you know, watching my kids play sports also is very uh, relaxing for me. So what's your, um, yeah, daughter's, I, what's your daughter's team name? Well, they are the Saints. Uh, it's, it's her high school. So uh, it's the high school name Saints. Yes. Yeah, so go Saints. Well, good luck for them today as well. That's fantastic. Thank you. And uh, okay, so well, you've kind of alluded to to the fact that you're 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 heavily into the music, and uh, as you pointed out at the top of this the, before we actually hit the record button, um, you've got uh, you've got an affinity for Welsh rock bands and stuff, indie rock bands. <laughs> but um, if you're going to throw one track into our isolation island uh, playlist, um, what would it be? What's your favourite piece of music that you would always always listen to? Oh my gosh. That is so hard to say. Um, I will say though, in my formative years in high school, I had a chance to see U2 on their war tour. Um, and, you know, I'd say that, I mean, there are so many tracks from U2. Um, I think that looking back at their history, for those of you that are also fans of U2, and actually getting the chance to see them in Dublin, um, two years ago when I taught at the Irish Management Institute, the, the last concerts I think they played before COVID, they played three nights at the O2 Arena there. And it was one, it was on my bucket list to see you two live in Dublin. So I got to check that off. Um, and, you know, understanding the role that Octung Baby had in the song One and how that song kept them going for another 20 years, the power of that and the power of the lyrics, that it's a very moving, um, you know, to me, motivational inspirational song um so from all that 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 would be my 
yeah. contribution. Well, that's a good. That's two, and in our in our one year of uh, of podcasting, that's two nominations for you too. Who'd have, what who'd was the other song? Was it uh, "Where the Streets Have No yeah. Name"? Or yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay. Well, New Year's Day is. I mean, you know, um, oh man, I will follow. They have so many just classic uh, songs, um, but uh, yeah, you can't go wrong with you two. Absolutely. And Absolutely uh, apart from, apart from your own, Neil, I mean, uh, what um, what book? Um, which would you would you add to the uh, the Zoom bookshelf behind us? Oh man, um, that's a great question. You know, one of the books that really influenced me early on, and I I still think is relevant, is really the Four Hour Work Week. And I mentioned the Four Hour Work Week with Tim Ferriss because it's all about scaling. And I know it's made for you know solopreneurs, but it can be for anyone. And I have just been passionate about trying to scale myself, you know, the agency owners that are listening to this, how do you scale all of your experiences and all of your knowledge? Uh, and it comes down to outsourcing, hiring people. It comes down to your processes and, and optimizing them. And that book just got a lot of juices going in that area. Um, and, you know, I will often go back to it, even though, like I said, it is AIDS. He's, he's, you know, come out with revised versions, but I just think the mindset um, is a very, very powerful one. The more entrepreneurial you are, I believe the more powerful that mindset becomes. Fantastic. And final question for you. And this is, uh, this is, uh, this is what a new one that we've, we've brought in. Um, you're obviously aware of the, what three words, um, geographical locator. Um, we come up with, uh, the idea of you've got to find three words that, that people that would identify you. Passionate, free thinker, hopefully innovator or innovative. We'll I'm go. hoping. We'll go with that. That's fantastic, Neil. Thank you very much indeed. And this could have been so easily a, a massive podcast. I know you're super busy. Um, and I've only covered about 10% of the questions that I had that were <laughs> written in my book. So, I mean, I, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to beg and plead at your doorstep that you'll come on again. But um, I can't wait until all the travel restrictions are lifted and uh, I can hop on a flight and maybe come and see you. Um, because um, and I, and, and I give, hope to be back in Sandy for myself. So, well, it, it would just be fantastic to, uh, to to meet up with you. You're a very inspirational guy, and thank you very much indeed. Um, anything I can do to help, obviously, let me know. All the usual juicy links and stuff are in the will be in the show notes on the website at thefuelpodcast.com. Um, it just remains for me to say thank you so much, Neil. All the very best for for the rest of 2021. Uh, and I hope that I and many of the UK's major comms agency can stay in touch and keep learning from you. Really wonderful stuff. And it's been a fantastic hour. All the very best to you, Neil. Thank you very much indeed. You are too kind, my friend. I just hope that everybody listening, um, really, if, if I can help them, if I gave them one idea that can help them innovate something they're doing or do something differently, or ideally find new business, then that will have made my day. So I hope uh, when you write those comments on iTunes for this podcast, uh, hopefully you'll mention this episode if it provided you value. No problem at all. Thank you so much, Neil. It's all the best to you and, uh, and to yours. And good luck. Go Saints. And uh, we'll, uh, we'll catch up with you soon. All the best. Thank you, my friend. Bye-bye. Cheers.